Okay, so it's two o'clock and um, um, welcome to addressing challenges to the health and child care systems. I just want to make three housekeeping notes before I turn it over to our moderator. The first one is this um, session will be recorded and the materials and the recording will be made available shortly. You will receive an email notification letting you know when the materials are ready for download. And the second one, you have two features in this uh, web webinar. You have the chat feature, and you can use the chat feature when you want to email uh, the host any technical difficulties that you might be having. And then you will also have the Q&A feature, and we would like for you to use that feature so that you can send your questions directly to the panelists. And so with that, I'd like to turn this over to Julia Ryan, okay? Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Jessica, and welcome everyone to this first webinar in our series on addressing challenges to the health and child care systems in these times of COVID-19. My name is Julia Ryan. I'm Vice President for Health at the Local Initiative Support Corporation, better known as LISC. And on behalf of my colleagues who've joined me today to bring this webinar to you, we just want to thank you very much for taking the time with us today to think about these important topics. Now, some of you might be wondering why health and child care are combined today as topics in this webinar. And the answer is that access to primary health care and access to affordable quality child care are both major determinants of health. That's true both for children and for adults and communities as well. At LISC, we're dedicated to using the tools of community development to promote health really at every turn. And that means financing affordable housing and grocery stores and childcare centers and health centers in some cases, on through to other things like building that work to build strong community organizations and neighborhood networks. So as part of that work, this webinar today is part of a series of six that LISC will be bringing you. Uh, we're delivering those different webinars on topics related to housing, and economic development, and today's on health in partnership with HUD. I want to note at the top here that our target audience is leaders of smaller jurisdictions. So for those of you who may be on the line from bigger places, you're very welcome to be with us today, but please know that our content is intentionally geared towards those smaller communities. Now for this health topic, this is the first of two webinars. Our goal today is to share with you information that might aid your thinking about access to primary care and access to child care in your community, and also hopefully expose you to some new resources that you might tap. That includes dollars, best practices, other kinds of support that you might need as you respond to the challenges that are in front of you. We will use the feedback that we get from you in this session to inform content for the second webinar, where we're going to aim to go deep, deeper on pieces that are most of interest to you. So please do respond to the polls when they come up. Also, as Jessica noted, you can put questions and notes into the chat box throughout the presentation today. Really, it can be even at a moment when something strikes you that you'd like to hear more about in the next installment of this series, just put a note in the chat and it'll help us take note of that. I also just want to highlight that our slides here today are chock full of website links and resource lists and such. We don't expect that you'll be able to consume all that on the fly as we go through here. As Jessica said, the slides will be available to you in a few weeks um, and you'll get an email uh, notifying you when that is ready for download. So without further ado, let's get started. Our first topic of discussion today will be childcare and early learning. And for this, we'll be hearing from my colleague, Cindy Larson, who's the National Program Director at LISC. Cindy is truly an expert in this industry. She has more than a 30-year career in various aspects of childcare and early learning, including significant time engaging with municipal and state leaders in Rhode Island and other places around the country around financing for quality facilities and other access issues. So, uh, Cindy, it's wonderful to have you. I'm gonna pass the ball to you and let you take it away. Thank you so much, Julia, for, uh, for your introduction and for introducing this important topic today. Um, thank you also to everyone who's joining us. I know there's a lot going on in the world, uh, and I appreciate your interest in this topic and you spending uh, this next hour or so with us to delve into it a little bit deeper. 
Um, as Julia noted, um, we're going to really be going through on a very high level and fairly quickly a lot of content today. Um, our intention was really to give a broad brush overview and introduction to the topic, um, and then to arm you with a lot of resources that you can dig into much deeper um, in the coming weeks once you receive this information. We will be holding another webinar where we're able to look much more closely um, at some very specific aspects of this. So with that, um, let me run through this content. Again, um, if questions arise, please put them in the Q&A. Um, there will also be some points where we'll be stopping for polls. I encourage you to participate in those polls. Um, they're going to really help us craft this technical support for you in a way that's most meaningful to you. Um, so you wouldn't be here today uh, listening to this if you didn't have a really good sense of why these are important issues. I think the issue of childcare has become very prevalent for everyone um, throughout the COVID crisis as children were mostly at home with their families or being looked after by family members or others in the community. But it's also important to focus on all of the really important things that early education brings um, to us, which you know includes everything from better school performance, higher graduation rates, lower incarceration, stronger economic potential, and improved health outcomes, which is why we are talking about this on a health webinar. Um, unfortunately, despite all that we know about how important this is, Quality affordable care is just out of reach for too many families, um, and the gaps are especially pronounced in communities of lesser opportunity. They're also very pronounced in rural areas, um, and much more so in suburban areas than even urban areas. Um, so this is a challenge that we've got to figure out how to solve for. It was a challenge before COVID. It's becoming more pronounced um, during this pandemic and as we look to recover from the pandemic. If you are not familiar with this tool, there is a tool um, that is known as Child Care Deserts Across America. Um, while there you know, are some imperfections in the way the data was looked at, I will give full disclosure on that, um, and folks are working on that all the time. It is the best data that's available to understand child care gaps currently. So please, um, on this next page, there's a link that will take you to an interactive map where you can really drill down write to your own census tract zip codes um, and figure out what it looks like in your communities. Um, and that will help inform you better. But what I will tell you is that most communities in America are suffering from an absence of affordable quality childcare right now. So when we talk about childcare, it's important to know that, that terms tend to be bantered about um, pretty interchangeably, but there's actually a number of different threads that make up child care and early care and education. It's important that you know that because those different types of care and different types of programs are often overseen by different state agencies, have different licensing requirements, have different funding streams, um, and so you know, as opposed to some types of programs that are much more streamlined, um, this can be a little bit all over the place and a little bit more challenging on the ground in some communities for folks to really navigate. Um, if you have, if you are not familiar with this, um, please avail yourselves of the childcare.gov site, which will let you see much more so what's happening in your own state. Um, but just to highlight a few of the types of programs that you'll see and hear about, it's everything from Head Start, Early Head Start, preschool, pre-K, school-aged child care, summer camp, family child care homes, and center-based. It's also important to note that um, across America, slightly more than 50% operate as small businesses, for-profit small businesses. The other 50% are nonprofit. So again, an industry that's really diverse um, in the types of care, but all of it funneling down and really impacting parents, um, children, and communities and economic recovery in some really profound ways. Um, for the most part, these systems operate on a state-based level, so the federal resources travel to the state and the states administer them. Certainly, there are city and municipal county-specific resources, but the for the most part, the large resources funnel through the state. So if you are not familiar with your state child care contact, you should definitely become familiar with them. The link on this page will take you um, to your state's information. Also very important on this page 
is information about your state's 2020 federal funding allocation for child care. And that federal funding allocation chart uh, will also include the particular new CARES resources, which have come about as a result of COVID. Um, and we will be touching more on those CARES resources. So this is just to highlight that that link is available to you and you should take a look. So let's talk now a little bit more about COVID-19 um, and the child care industry. Um, again, you probably wouldn't be here if you hadn't already heard some of this, but child care is having a particularly challenging time in the era of COVID. Um, it went into the pandemic already struggling in many cases, but has been particularly hard hit by this. States have not been consistent in the way they viewed child care throughout the pandemic. Um, there are states that forced all programs to close, so child care essentially ceased to operate during the pandemic. Other states didn't deem the industry as um, essential and allowed them to remain open. Many states allowed child care to remain open, but under very new regulations um, and largely with a focus on first responders and other essential personnel. Um, at this point, as we're here on this webinar today, most states have reopened child care in some form, um, but generally under new regulations with enhanced health and safety, um, and that's something many providers are really struggling with. You can learn more about your state's response um, at that link that was provided on the prior slide. Um, in terms of the pandemic and the child care industry, um, there are federal resources that have been allocated to help. This slide does have a link that will take you to information um, on those resources. What I will tell you is that there's a very wide gap between the resources that have been provided today and the resources that are estimated to be needed for genuine recovery. Um, and it's a multi-billion dollar gap. Um, it's not a small gap by any means. Um, on this page, this is a link to just some articles. So if you're really not that familiar with this, if you feel like you haven't been looped in all that well to what's going, I tried to select some things that would just really give you a flavor for it so that as you're in your own communities, you can feel better equipped to have these conversations about what did this really mean for childcare around their closing? What does it really mean for reopening? Um, how many childcare workers were out of work? What kind of resources are needed? How did Paycheck Protection Program help? Those types of things. Um, just a couple of quick data points. In terms of the Paycheck Protection Program, which many saw as a potentially great resource, only 6% of childcare providers to date have availed themselves of that program. So, some of the really obvious resources that have been available, there's been real disconnects for this particular industry. Um, what I think we all know is that childcare is really essential to fully achieve economic recovery. Um, I do wanna highlight for you that the Bipartisan Policy Institute had a fabulous webinar not too long ago that featured state childcare administrators from 10 very different states. Um, and you can view that webinar, the link is here. I think that'll give you a really good flavor for what's happening across the country. Um, and so I would suggest taking an additional hour or so um, and taking a look at that. Um, and with that, we are at our first poll. Um, we wanna know a little bit more before we really delve into some of the, the greater mute. We wanna know a little bit more about some of the data points that would be helpful to you. So I'm gonna pass the ball. Um, to Jessica, who's gonna launch the poll right now um, and give you some instructions for that. Okay, so Again. I'm, opening up, I'm opening up this first poll right here. And right now it's giving you, it should give you an, an option to answer the, the poll questions. And so just feel free to answer the questions. Thanks, Jessica and Cindy. And I'm sure folks are seeing now the text on the slide matches the poll on the right, if that helps with your reading ease. Um, so Julia, again here, I, I just wanted to take a moment and ask you, Cindy, um, as we learn about these, the varied formal pieces of the child care industry, it just strikes me that over the last few months, people came up with so many temporary child care solutions. You know, many of us relied on friends or neighbors or other networks that just kind of popped up in this moment of crisis. But in some ways, this might have hidden the severity of the problem is my sense. Can you share just a few things maybe that should be top of mind for public officials as they try to figure out the longer term solutions? 
Sure, that's a great question. Um, I do think that's absolutely true. One of the real challenges in talking about childcare at the moment is that, I, you know, I don't think we really have great data right now or are fully aware of what we're trying to solve for. Um, many people work from home. That certainly is not true of lower income workers, first responders, folks like that. But um, as everyone knows, many workplaces did switch to working at home, which allowed some people um, to have an interesting work-life juggle uh, where they were caring for children. Um, many folks relied on neighbors, um, immediate family members, others. Um, what we do know is that as childcare is starting to reopen, many centers are reporting that they're only about 30% enrolled or so. So parents are being very slow to return their children to childcare, even as things reopen. Um, and that, uh, you know, that means that the problem is masked at this point. So one of the ways that municipal leaders can really engage is to make sure they're connected into what's happening in their states to really gather accurate data, um, whether it's polling families, polling childcare, polling workplaces, but to really try to make sure that they have the most accurate and recent data for their communities in terms of what need is. Um, you know, I think over the next 12 to 18 months, we'll be seeing the child care industry evolve a bit. Um, and it's just important to really get connected at the local level to what's happening around that. Okay, we have the results, Julia, if you want to report out, or Cindy. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's good advice, Cindy. Um, and as we look to the polls, so it seems like the interests here are pretty spread across the items that we listed here, but um, most interest, not surprisingly, in understanding the funding mechanisms and challenges and things that are really specific to COVID and the, the environment that we're in right now. Seems like next up, uh, most of interest would be things related to COVID or other disaster recovery related to childcare, and then things specific to the rural environment. Great. Um, I mean, that's very helpful feedback. And we actually, we're going to launch into some uh, some discussion about disaster pretty soon. Um, and can definitely, I think the rural feedback is, is really good as we work to build this out, um, you know, for some of our future resources. So with that, let's kick over to talking more about municipalities and child care. Um, I will just say, although this is intended to be sort of a cover slide, I would be remiss if I didn't stop on this slide for a minute and tell you a little bit about the picture that you're looking at. So this is a real child care center. Um, the, the center which houses Head Start, Early Head Start, Infant Child Care, um, Preschool Child Care, State Funded, Pre-K, and as well as Family Support Programming, and is actually adjacent to a health care center, would never have been developed without a strong partnership without, with a municipality. Um, this building is in a small city. The population is just under 30,000, so not tiny, um, but certainly not a large urban area by any means. And the city found themselves with a very large tract of land that had been left behind by the military, actually. Um, lots of contamination on the land, but in a really great location for families. Um, and they worked with some community-based partners to develop community assets. So, you know, the community-based partners raised the funding, created the structure, but the city provided the land um, and it made this project happen. So, you know, just, Again, I wanted to give a shout out to this, this great project, which we might delve into a little bit more on our next webinar. Um, so why do we care about this at the municipal level? You all know this. I already know that. I, I created this slide and the links that are on it so that you yourselves would have some talking points. So, you know, this matters because it impacts kids' healthy development. It impacts workforce. It impacts school readiness, economic development. And it helps to level the playing field for families that don't have the same advantages as others. Um, and these are all things that matter. These are all our kids. These are all our families. Um, again, I wanted you to have this because, you know, each of these items links to some really important data and background material that as you yourselves advocate for resources in your communities, you can use for your own applications, presentations, and other things. 
Um, and we are actually at another poll, not coincidentally, so this is focused on something just a little bit different. But what I wanted to know before I talk a little bit about recovery is more about what you're hearing in your cities. And I realize that some of your cities are tiny, small towns. Um, so know that when I use the term city, um, I'm using it in a very all-inclusive way. Um, but I'm interested to know what you're hearing. Um, so I'm going to pass this over to launch the poll. Um, again, the questions for the poll will show up in the right-hand column, but you can also see them right here on their screen. Um, and just take a couple of quick seconds to just answer what you're seeing, if you would. And as people enter in their answers, Cindy, I think one of the things that, that makes it really hard for public officials to get a read on the needs such as these is that providers don't always speak in a collective voice, right? Like they might not be represented by an association or they might not be involved in a chamber or other kind of business association that might exist with other sectors. Does that track with what you've seen out there or can you talk a little bit about such a, Yeah, such a great, that's a really great point. And it's actually one of the reasons why I went over what are the types of, of care is um, there it does fall into so many categories that it makes it really difficult to have a unified voice. So you may have a Head Start Association, you may have a Child Care Association, you may have a School Age Child Care Association, you may have a business owners of child care association, and all of them are saying the same but slightly different things, and it makes it really tricky um, at a municipal um, or other leadership role to really figure out which are the key voices to listen to. So one of the really great things you could do in your community is actually try to focus on bringing all those voices together to come up with some sort of unified messaging um, and priorities, and that's you know, that's a very low resource way. I mean, often you're, you know, the smallest of towns are likely to not have the largest dollar resources to put towards something, but it doesn't always have to be about dollars. Um, you know, really helping to be the ones to help guide that crafted um, and unified message could be a fantastic way to engage. Mm -hmm. And we have the results. Yeah, and it looks like there's some clear leaders in this one. So. Um, the top answers are that parents are afraid to send children to child care or that they can't find care that meets their needs. I think that tracks really well with what we have been seeing around the country, unfortunately. Any comments on that, Cindy? Or? Uh, no, just that that does track really well with what we've been seeing around the country. And um, it's, you know, I wish that I were here today with a magic answer to this, but definitely don't have it. Um, and, you know, I. One of the things that we're seeing is that as childcare has begun to reopen and folks have, have sent kids back, that um, in many cases the, the fear is escalating and not reducing. So, you know, particularly as um, some of the trends in COVID track up instead of leveling off. So, um, you know, there are a lot of challenges. So let's, let's delve into some solutions, um, but know that it's helpful. That was very helpful feedback from all of you. Yeah, um, so finally, the next next step in the poll results was uh, access of financial resources for child care providers. So that's a great segue to where you're headed. Yes. <laughs> so thinking about, um, you know, I've broken the supports that municipalities can provide into a couple of categories. One is focusing first on some of the COVID specific pieces. And then before we wrap, we'll also talk just about some of the more general pieces. Um, Thinking about COVID specific, I do want to make sure that all of you are aware that there is CDC guidance um, around the reopening of childcare, whether or not states or individual locales are following it um, is ultimately up to state regulators, but you know, it's helpful to know what the guidance is to have a sense even of some of the barriers that providers may be facing in opening or in accommodating all needs. Um, in terms of things that you can do, obviously helping with funding is a key thing. Um, but recognizing that funding is challenging for everyone, there may be other ways that you can help with resources. So by elevating the discussion, is there private philanthropy that might be able to help that you could bring greater attention to? 
Um, thinking about supplies, you know, it, it may seem silly, but childcare providers were often running on such incredibly tight margins that even having to purchase all of these additional supplies has really um, just been insurmountable for some of them. So if there are ways that you can help support bulk purchasing or some of those kinds of things, that could be a phenomenal support for providers, which in turn will help families because the more that we can get providers open and meeting family needs, um, the better it is for everyone in the community. Um, and again, along those lines, thinking about partnerships. So where there's not funding, um, you have a unique position that you all hold in your communities as leaders. And whether you're elected leaders, appointed, um, on staff, do a, you know, in support programs. So I did see we have folks in all kinds of roles on this webinar. Um, you can help by really bringing people together around this issue, and that will do a lot more for the issue than you may realize. Um, and then in terms of supporting people in places, um, is there available space? Space is an incredibly expensive and hard to come by thing in convenient locations. Um, are you getting information about funding sources that are available, and is there a way that you can pass that along to providers so that you're sure that they have the most recent information? Um, don't assume that just because the state is getting the information that that's necessarily making it to the hands of everybody in your community. So thinking about whether there's ways that you can be an intermediary in that. Um, and then also just making sure that child care providers are at the table around these discussions. This is a really important industry um, for families and for communities, and they're not always an active part of the discussions that are happening. So that's something that you can be aware of um, and really create a difference through. I want to make sure you're aware of this comprehensive resource guide. Again, you will be getting a copy of this presentation so you can really delve into all of this. Um, I did not unbundle this resource guide because somebody already developed this for all of you. So what you really need is just to go through it um, and avail yourselves of it. This is an incredible resource that was put together um, by an interdisciplinary committee um, involving a number of federal agencies. While the guide was really developed to support the needs of states, the resources that are in it are incredibly appropriate for counties, cities as well. Um, there is an extensive listing of resources both technical and financial in there. There's a guide that helps you create your own community plan. Um, a whole summary of all of the different terms you might hear bantered about. Um, it's really just a phenomenal resource, so please do um, make sure that you take a look at that. And then the other thing that I would say is, you know, COVID has been a crisis, so there's all kinds of crises that can happen. There's natural disasters, there's the type of disaster that we're all in right now. Um, and how can we be better prepared before something happens the next time? One of the things that we've discovered in our work um, and in our work with states is that it's not unusual to not have private child care, so community-based settings, whether they're for-profit businesses or nonprofit agencies, particularly well-connected to city emergency preparedness plans. So obviously public schools and public buildings and all of those things are very connected into that plan, but you can have lots and lots of very vulnerable kids in settings and it's not necessarily connected to the plan. So please make sure to give some thought to that. Um, and I also want to make sure that you have access to this great comprehensive toolkit, um, which helps child care programs plan for emergency preparedness. Um, and one of the things we've seen really well done um, and honestly, this is something that small towns do the best, um, is helping to support these providers in coming up with a plan that aligns well with the, with the municipal plan. Um, so not thinking about the crisis, just thinking about child care. And it's, I know it's hard to not think about the crisis. I think about the crisis every day too. Um, but just a reminder that child care really needs champions every day and not just in times of crisis. This was an industry that was somewhat in crisis before the pandemic, um, and that was also causing a crisis for families in many cases before the pandemic. Um, there has never been access to enough affordable quality childcare that really meets the needs of families um, across multiple work shifts, 
um, in geographies, rural areas are particularly challenged around this because it's very difficult to do child care without some degree of scale. So you end up largely with family child care or with families needing to travel a long way to access center-based care. Um, there are unique challenges. So just thinking about what you can do every day. Um, and I want to point out that there's a lot of things on this list. Actually, most of things on, on this list are not about money. So I know that money can solve a lot of problems, but there's a whole lot that you can do that isn't about money as well. Um, one of them is helping figure out how to have a better read on what are the needs and what are the resources in the community. Um, because this is in many ways um, somewhat of a, not fractured, but a system that runs in a variety of ways, it's often hard to fully assess it. So that's something you can look at your local community assets to help do. You can help make it a priority. Um, in many ways, you have a bully pulpit to raise important issues, so use it in this way. Make sure early education, child care providers have a seat at the table when important discussions are happening so that you can better understand their issues and help help them better be able to serve family needs in the community. Um, you can support access by doing everything from easing zoning and building barriers um, to thinking about transportation and whether the way transportation happens right now um, is supporting or creating a barrier. Um, and you can also help with promoting health and safety, which everybody wants, um, from everything from the emergency preparedness to thinking about ways to encourage strong transition between child care and public school um, to overall professional development. There's lots of professional development happening in public schools all the time, so think about are there ways that you could create joint professional development, um, which would be incredibly helpful to the industry and helpful to getting together all of the folks that are thinking about kids and families in your cities and towns. Um, I just wanted to quickly feature this example from a municipality, um, a fairly small city. Uh, and this is an example of land. So, you know, many times folks will talk about um, cities and towns thinking about empty buildings or space within buildings that they may have. Now, first of all, you may just not have empty buildings or empty space. Buildings are expensive. And in many cases, if there is open space, it's because it's not that great, right? So you're often using the best spaces that you have. But particularly as we move out into rural and very suburban areas, land is something that often exists. So this is an example of a municipal complex where you have um, a high school, um, a smaller rec center, a number of the, the city's athletic fields, you know, their football field, their baseball diamonds, those types of things. Um, a small corner of the property, which is smaller than even the athletic field, where the red dot is on your screen, um, was actually leased to a community-based Head Start and child care provider. That small size slice of land, which was leased for a dollar a year to them, so the city didn't give up the land, um, but leased the land to them, allowed them to build a center that had 10 classrooms of really high quality Head Start, Early Head Start, infant child care, preschool child care, um, as well as family support programming and professional development programming. As the building was there, many other um, sorts of things happened, including sharing some services, sharing food service, um, streamlining some of the transportation needs. So, um, you know, it just became an incredible opportunity. Um, and as you think about land and say, well, but in a time of crisis, you may not have time to build, I just wanted to provide you with a couple of resources around modular spaces, which can often be a much quicker, um, easier way to get things open. Cindy, you have about five more minutes. Yeah, I'm just wrapping up. So I uh, just want to highlight that in the addendum, um, you do have, we've touched on um, the CARES Act funding and things that are happening. So I want to just make sure that you know that in the addendum, you do have all the information on that, um, as well as an overview of some pending legislative proposals. Um, and with that, we're just going to launch our final poll for this segment, uh, where we hear more about what you want to know for future webinars. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Jessica to launch this next poll. 
All right. And while she does that, I know that um, a few folks have been writing in that they'd like to select more options than they're able to on the poll. I just want to note um, this might be one of the most important polls in the session because it'll inform what we do in our next webinar. So if you're not able to say what you want to say, just drop a quick note in the chat and we'll take note of that. Now, Cindy, I know also that there's a coalition of community development financial institutions like LISC that are putting out some information of late uh, related to COVID legislation and some of the other resource pools that are in some of the slides that you've highlighted here. Can you just tell us about that for a moment? Sure, I would love to. Um, so, LISC is a community development financial institution. There are several um, such entities across the country that work on issues of early childhood through a little bit of a different lens than you may be used to hearing about. Our focus tends to be on financing and facilities and access issues in communities. Um, we are part of a network called the National Children's Facilities Network. You should look up that network. I can actually put some information in the chat even on it. Um, and there will be information coming out through the National Children's Facility Network to help folks think about really these in infrastructure and financing issues, which are a little bit different. There's lots of advocacy and supports around curriculum, workforce, those other pieces, but CDFIs have been a bit unique in terms of helping think about the actual building places and financing that make up that backbone. Okay, and it looks like our poll results are coming in. So thank you for that, Cindy. And one of the top things folks want to hear about is learning more about the COVID-19 recovery and child care. Um, so I think more along the lines of what Cindy has been sharing here, and there's quite an even spread across other things. So um, please do keep making some notes in the chat and Q&A as we transition here to our next topic, and um, we'll be thoughtful about what we bring back to you in the next round. Thank you so much, Cindy. Appreciate it very much. Absolutely. Okay. So for the next section of our webinar today, we're going to be talking about access to primary health care. Um, for this, I'm joined by my colleague Shai Loros, also a National Program Director at LISC Over Health Initiative. Uh, Shai has a long history in community development, green building, and community health. Um, LISC defines health quite broadly as we think about the varied things that address social determinants of health and broader wellness in communities. Uh, Shai has a lot of expertise on all of that, but um, today is a great moment for her to particularly focus in on federally qualified health centers. So with that, Shai, you can take it away. Thanks, Julia. Uh, and thank you again all for joining. Um, and I'm going to thank you in advance for actively participating in today's webinar. Uh, just as with uh, my colleague Cindy's presentation, uh, I'm going to ask you to, to respond to a couple polls, and there'll be uh, a Q&A session that follows the presentation. Um, and I want to thank those of you who were able to take the survey previous to the webinar. It was helpful to see your interest both for this session and the next, and helped to guide the design of this presentation. Um, and two of the things I'll ask of you now as we move into it, what are the sending questions during the presentation if they arise uh, during the Q&A? Um, I know this has been said before, but I just want to reiterate it. Um, and you can submit uh, as we're going once we move into uh, that part of the agenda, um, and you can submit at any point in the chat function topics which you're interested in learning more about in the next health webinar. Um, and you should feel free to, to broaden from those topics that are covered here to zoom in further for additional detail on items you want to know more about. I want to let you know up front a couple things about me. Uh, one is that I live in a rural area in New York where I participate, albeit peripherally, uh, in rural governance here. And I've spent much time throughout my life uh, with family who live in different rural parts of the country, uh, namely in Montana and Maine. So I, I get the rural islands and high plains and northeastern rural specific life. Um, and the others that I've worked on regional catastrophic planning, including pandemic planning and response. So my approach to these issues at hand today is steeped in my knowledge in all of the many hats that you all wear 
and the constraints you must work with to get the job done. So hopefully I've done a good job um, with this. And then lastly, I just want to reiterate that uh, for this portion of the webinar too, as with childcare, this presentation is designed to focus on the pandemic response and resiliency issues faced by small rural jurisdictions, as Julia said earlier. Uh, again, with populations in the range of eight to 40,000. So while we may have friends from larger areas joining us, just please note that uh, in the case of any perceived discrepancy with your larger jurisdictions, we're really targeting smaller rural areas. Okay, with that again, thank you for your engagement in the session. We'll jump right in. If you could head to the next slide, please. You'll be turning your own slides, Sean. Oh, okay. Oh, no, That's you can actually fine. move them to me, Jeff, and we'll take it from there. Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so in my work these days and in the preparation for a conversation today, I've spoken with colleagues and experts in the field of rural public health. And the one constantly recurring theme of these discussions is that much of the work needed right now is good, old-fashioned, common-sense stuff. And the difficulty sometimes is in the prioritization, so knowing where, how, when, and for who we need to provide additional support. So I've organized this presentation based on supporting just that. I've outlined financial and informational resources that captures opportunities and case studies of how others have taken on some of the COVID-19 pandemic issues and options to explore as you continue to work on these issues. Now, some of the tools that support us in this work are a handful of really incredible online databases and libraries that have gotten ever more robust. I'm starting here with this map with where we're at today. Specifically, this image captures COVID cases as of this past Wednesday. I found it helpful to look around at neighboring counties to get an idea of what spread looks like around the area I'm working on. And I, you've probably seen, we've all been following the recent rural surges. And you can see it here by county. Uh, in fact, just a moment ago, this map was much lighter by way of that key on the, the bottom right-hand side. And it was essentially all a light pastel sea green just a month previous to that. So we know that this is moving very fast, uh, which of course doesn't help things. Uh, of course, even with the surge, rural areas still benefit from the built-in social distancing of low density, but by population, we've seen states like recently in Utah, where 44% of new cases were in rural areas. But also testing, which really supports obtaining funding, has been low. So for example, Archer County in Texas had 3.6 tests per 1,000 residents. And part of what we're trying to avoid here is with a concrete example in Toole County, Montana, an assisted living facility infection resulted in a dozen cases and three deaths. And the problem was that with a local hospital having only a total of 21 beds and two ventilators, this is a very heavy caseload that quickly overwhelms local healthcare capacity for the area. But one thing you can't see on this particular map is rural racial disparity. And black people have a disproportionate share of the population in 22% of U.S. counties, and these areas account for more than half of the virus cases and 60% of deaths. So now the vast majority of these counties, 91% of them, are located in the south, and you can sort of see this on the map here. And then the Phoenix are one-third of the COVID cases uh, in Idaho and Weiser, Jerome, and Burley counties, for example while the Phoenix population only accounts for 12% of the state's total population. And Native American and Alaskan Native people face particular barriers to healthcare that make it challenging to obtain coronavirus testing and treatment services due in part to lack of access to IHS, to the Indian Health Services. So looking at these maps sometimes requires digging deeper, similar to as Cindy mentioned earlier, to really getting an understanding and a handle over what the issues are. Uh, next slide, please, if we've passed it over. Great, thank you. I want to put us on the same page up front on what have been the immediate resources provided specifically for rural health from the CARES Act. 
so that we can then build from there today. We have compiled an addendum to this PowerPoint similar to as Cindy has with childcare, which is located at the end of this slide deck from the health section, which will be shared with you all via email as was noted. And it contains a detailed overview of relevant federal resources with rural specific and some generally applicable, meaning not rural restricted, but rural eligible federal monies. I will highlight a few elements of the CARES Act here. So for health clinics, $225 million have been allocated to rural health clinics for building or construction of temporary structures, the leasing of property and retrofitting facilities that are necessary to support COVID-19 testing. 79.5 million has been allocated for rural health services grants, for rural healthcare outreach, rural health network development, and small healthcare provider quality improvement to strengthen community health by focusing on quality improvement, but also increasing healthcare access, coordination of care, and integration of services. And federally qualified health centers have also received a large amount of funding on a per patient level for testing and for treatment. These health centers are community-based healthcare providers that receive funds from the HRSA Health Center program to provide primary care services in underserved areas, meaning that they hold a special reimbursement designation from the Bureau of Primary Health Care and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services from HHS, from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Now, on broadband access, which is now proving to be a critical health infrastructure, especially for telehealth services, I want to highlight a couple more things. $100 million was provided to the ReConnect program to help ensure rural Americans have access to broadband, the need for which is now increasingly apparent also as millions of Americans work from home across the country where feasible. Two other resources to highlight are for the financial support of private medical practices. Now, Cindy mentioned about the PPP. There are still funds available for the Paycheck Protection Program. The application window was given a five-week extension until August 8th from a previous June 30th application deadline, because as of that date, there was still $130 billion that had yet to be allocated, and that was a $660 billion allocation from the CARES Act. So this loan allows small businesses to keep employees on their payroll, as well as covering other critical operating expenses. So still an opportunity. The USDA has also made $1 billion in loan guarantees available to help rural businesses with the Business and Industry CARES Act program. And these loans must be used as working capital, uh, but it's working capital to prevent to prepare, to prepare, for, <laughs> prepare for, excuse me, or respond to the effects of the coronavirus pandemic. There's another series of webinars on rural small business and economic development where you can hear more in-depth discussion of these and other resources, so I won't be going into detail today on that. Next slide, please. So let's take a step back now, and we're gonna launch a poll if you could please respond in the chat section so that we can get a better idea for you, who provides healthcare services to your jurisdiction? Is it rural health clinics, federally qualified health centers? Is it large regional health and hospital systems or private primary care clinics, private family practices or other? And other could be wellness as in Sense, vision, therapy, acupuncture, and whatnot. Thanks, Shai. We'll, we'll give folks a minute to respond. But if they're actually not sure, should they write into the chat, you think? You know, uh, Julia, thanks for bringing that up. Um, when, when, because of the way that these uh, surveys are structured in the software here, they can only select one option. So one thing is, uh, if you have more than one answer in the chat, say, well, I selected B, but 
da, 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 da. And also, if it's other, please do put in the chat that additional information. Because again, the more that we can call from you, the better we can be more specified and customized for the next uh, webinar. So, Julia, could you um, tally our results? We'll give Jessica an opportunity to, to do that on the back end at this moment. All right. I think she, she's good now. Thank All you. Right. Yep, they're in. So the, the leading answer is large regional health and hospital systems. Mm -hmm. And after that, it seems that private, prim, private primary care clinics is probably next up, and then sort of a pretty even tie across the other kinds of clinics and family practices. Great, so that's really helpful and helpful to know um, as we move forward. Um, and let's do that now. So Julia, can you pass us to the next slide, please? Um, so let's bring together the CARES Act funding for rural COVID response and the types of healthcare provision. In this case, we're um, gonna try and really focus now on, on larger health systems. Um, now larger health systems and the rural health clinics all also actually work hand in hand and are sometimes pieces or, or operational as satellite practices of one another, um, along with federally qualified health centers. Um, now, each of your local government's strong suits more than likely is connection, right? You're already connected with a variety of public, private, and not-for-profit entities. In other words, Rurally speaking, everyone sort of knows everyone. So these connections can be put to use with the CARES funds to support your rural health clinics and large health systems, especially, by taking some of the weight off of them to address or direct resident needs that impact those residents' health, but occur outside the walls of the medical facilities. And in community health, we call this the social determinants of health. Some of you may be familiar with this term. Um, some of you, this is not necessarily your working practice, um, and I acknowledge that community and public health may not be some of your specialty because, as we mentioned earlier, we know that you're responsible for a variety of issues in your localities. But the social determinants of health covers 80 to 90 percent of people's health status and even though it includes things like housing access to healthy food transportation education it's all critical to health and that's compared to 10 to 20 percent that medical care specifically accounts for for individual health so we can use local intel combined with available data sets including from health systems that you can garner to target vulnerable populations for preventative approach, preventative outreach and actions to support individuals and households in rural communities. And this could include breakdowns, for example, by labor type. So, so for example, rural miners are more susceptible to acute cases of COVID-19 due to pre-existing compromised lungs from their work. I want to stay on labor for another moment now because physiological health and financial health are virtually inextricable. And because of the shutdowns, lockdowns, the impacts of the pandemic on the economy, many lower income rural residents will experience or have already begun to experience new or increased financial hardship. So the medical data tells us that as personal and household economic distress increases, there are two results. The ability to attend to health issues and seek medical care decreases for those individuals and households, as well as their purchase and consumption of healthy food. There's a lot of other issues as well. Those are the two primary that the data has tracked. This will result in decreased utilization of both healthcare maintenance and chronic disease maintenance services, leading to increased emergency medical needs as folks put off care until crisis moments, and it also leads to increased susceptibility to COVID-19 for some residents, especially as a result of the experience of significant stress. And stress causes inflammation 
in the body, which enables vulnerability to illness and disease. Now, the combination of these impacts strains the rural health care sector and reduces its sustainability to weather an extended pandemic and to serve the community overall. Think back to the assisted care uh, influx at the uh, hospital that I mentioned earlier. Therefore, activities and interventions to address these health determinants are all public health resiliency measures that support COVID-19 response and recovery and the healthcare systems in rural areas. Now, one of the ways we can do this in small rural jurisdictions is to build off of your existing systems of continuum of care networks. These networks were created in response to HUD requirements to address rural homelessness. So these are not new. This is from the McKinney-Vento Act Amendment from 94. And it brings together all sectors and ensures that clients, that patients don't get lost and get also the support that they need. So these are well-suited collaboration structures to utilize and local government can bolster and help prop them up, which will help to take some of the load off of rural health clinics and especially larger hospital systems and larger health systems. Now, other forms of support to these clinics and health centers is to shoulder some of the strain on ensuring that residents access needed medical care, which can be, as you see on this slide, facilitating or taking on community outreach or working on ways to address accessibility limitations to medical care with various forms of transportation, or mobile medical provision, or information about newly covered COVID-related services. And go to the next slide, please. So now I want to share an example of this in action in Georgia, where senior housing and a federally qualified health center are connected to coordinate and share expertise to improve the health outcomes of senior residents. The health clinic supported property managers of a senior housing building in scanning medical and social determinative health needs of the residents and also worked with them to create programming to address the seniors' needs. And one notable attribute here is that this organizational collaboration followed the co-location of the development of the senior housing across from the health clinic as part of LISC's Healthy Futures Fund, which financed the project. Next slide, please. And one thing that's a helpful uh, webinar resource is to look at supporting vulnerable communities through a public health crisis. And we'll have this link posted up on how healthcare organizations can provide support to vulnerable populations at higher risk for more severe COVID reactions to mitigate health risks and improve outcomes. So speaking of supporting more vulnerable populations and tackling COVID-specific issues, I want to take a moment to hear from you on what are the primary issues for healthcare providers at your jurisdictions. Is it access to personal protective equipment, financial sustainability, for continuity of operations of clinics and private practices? Is it transition to outdoor health care and telehealth services, which might be financial or technical or infrastructure limitations, most especially broadband access, uh, the medical health of, I'm sorry, the mental health of health care workers, um, or resident accessibility to care, which might be related to distance, transportation, or their access to the internet. And again, you can write uh, in the chat box if you don't find that any of these are your primary issues. Yeah. Thanks, Shay. And while folks are, are writing in their answers and we're tallying the poll, just want to note someone wrote in on the, the Q&A to us that they really want more of these examples of how the resources can be applied in, in practice to address some of these issues. So noted. Thank you very much for that comment. Um, and that's very much the goal for our second webinar after this overview one. But you know what, uh, Julia, thank you for highlighting that um, and calling it out right now. Um, I guess what's um, exciting for me about that comment is um, 
uh, whomever wrote that is aligned with the <laughs> the, uh, the remainder of this presentation, which is really doing just that. Um, it's going to highlight a handful of case studies and um, solutions that other rural areas have instigated. Um, and um, I've, I've, of course, uh, pulled some of the more successful ones, so they are options for you to consider for your areas. Um, okay. So, Julia, maybe now you could, um, again, tally uh, the uh, yeah. slide results. Yeah, we got it right here. So before we dig into those examples, it seems that financial sustainability and continuity of operations is top of mind. Uh, for folks with some of the key issues for their health care providers. Also supporting residents to access that medical, dental, vision, broader wellness treatment is um, also very key and not surprisingly PPP access, PPE access rather. Great. Thank you, Julia. Um, okay, let's move on to the next slide. Um, so over the next couple of slides, I've collated some of the key resources and reference sites that are instrumental in tracking and providing all aspects of support for rural health issues specifically, um, including financial and informational support um, with technical assistance opportunities. Uh, the first of these two slides is national but they provide regional and state breakdowns as well within that. And the following slide, which we'll get to in a moment, has a small handful of exemplary rural resource sites. So while they're state specific, they provide great reference for COVID response and also have relevant uh, federal links and resources. Um, so, and again, um, as I just mentioned, uh, by way of that comment, um, this will be sort of our, our transition or segue that for the remainder of the presentation, uh, we'll be addressing these very issues that you just pulled on um, and, and that uh, Julia relayed uh, on the survey. Um, so, sorry, Julia, not ready to go to the next one, if you could, thank you. Um, so you'll see here, as I mentioned, national resources. And I want to highlight that the Rural Health Information Hub is an incredible resource. I highly recommend that if you have any questions, you start here to search for answers. And when we send you the deck, I'll be sure to mark this site, which is on this slide second from the bottom, with an asterisk to call it out for you. Um, and now you can go to the next slide. Thank you again. Uh, these are the selected state sites that I mentioned earlier. Um, now, excuse me, um, can you go to the next slide, please? In cases where there is a shortage of personal protective equipment, we have an example where many small clinics came together to make a bulk order. 30 unaffiliated clinics not connected with any large healthcare system participated in shared purchasing to get personal protective equipment, PPE, from one vendor. This was facilitated by the Virginia Rural Health Association and their role was to work with the vendor as an intermediary on behalf of the clinics and then once the order was received, the, Vir the Virginia Rural Health Association staff then delivered the PPE to these clinics across the state. I'll also note here, while we're on the lack of PPE, that that has been causing an extreme amount of stress, understandably so, for healthcare workers, and has contributed to worsening mental health among these workers. Now, an innovative program of mental wellness support for healthcare workers in North Carolina is a helpline for healthcare workers and community members called the Hope for Healers Helpline. The helpline was previously used for hurricane relief efforts and is now repurposed and available for every North Carolina county for COVID response support. And this was set up in May to provide resilience and mental health support to healthcare workers, but also to their families experiencing stress 
from responding to COVID-19. And the helpline is available 24 seven and callers receive follow-up <clears throat> from a volunteer licensed behavioral health professional. Can you go to the next slide, please? Now, another case study to highlight is a form of health provision outside of the clinic to address accessibility issues, mobile units for delivering healthcare, and also food for families. So in Georgia, Care Partners mobilized a bus on loan from the Swainsboro Fire Department to serve two counties. This is Manuel and Candler. They called it the Thrive Bus, taking hope, recovery, integrated care, and vitality everywhere. It's pretty catchy, Thrive. It staffed a certified addiction counselor, a registered nurse, and a community support worker to conduct basic medical and mental health screenings and address any medical issues found, check patients for COVID-19 symptoms, and deliver food to families suffering food insecurity. Next slide. For those of you looking to support healthcare providers, especially as they transition their services to provide care in different settings that require different ways of working and interacting. These curated online resources here provide webinars and some technical assistance for practitioners. Next slide. And here are times for direct support for those working in care facilities or supporting those types of activities. These online webinars and open office hours occur every week while the pandemic is in effect. Next slide. Now I wanna focus on those forms of support that address the digital components of healthcare to support COVID response and resiliency. It's important to note that there are many elements of the CARES Act that support digital medicine, including funding to build and expand the infrastructure for telehealth, to run fiber and Wi-Fi stations, to purchase hardware and software, the labor and capital, to support local governments, as well as schools and families, to subsidize the cost of internet service and technical support to families to overcome barriers to accessibility, which sometimes means walking them through how to get hooked up and some online basics. It also, as some of you may know, allowed for many regulatory shifts and easing of requirements to make a rapid shift to telehealth realistic. Now, this combines the fact that Medicaid is increasing payment rates for doctor visits will be a real help to keeping smaller clinics and private practices in business. Now, I won't go over the distance learning and telemedicine grant program here uh, in detail as the deadline for the application window just recently passed. However, I did wanna bring it up and note that the relationship between learning and education and telemedicine are explicit in this program being that schools, health clinics, and families can all benefit with increased ease of telecommunications as teachers, as students, as medical professionals, and rural residents. And there may be more opportunities in the future under this program. Uh, right now, I know we are all waiting to hear on the Moving Forward Act for what additional financial resources will be available to us all as we continue to address this crisis, and I, I hope that uh, there will be more funds available for this. Next slide. Another case study. These are two examples of COVID-19 telehealth that I thought were worthwhile to share with this group as you think about ways to support your jurisdictions. Uh, one is this hybrid of curbside health and telehealth in rural Virginia. Now, the organization Virginia Health Catalyst created a teledentistry protocol and a related uh, how-to resource for practitioners. So they developed a set of standards to help providers 
conduct teledentistry visits with patients who don't have the needed technology at home by driving to the clinic's parking lot and receiving equipment and assistance from a staff member at their car while the dentist inside uses digital mobile technology to conduct the appointment. So this was a combination of developing the innovation, sharing best practices, and providing up-to-date information on Medicaid regulatory changes to them to make the transition as easy and feasible as possible for dental practices. And because dental health is critical and supportive to overall individual health, yet more potentially fraught with COVID fears, this solution is particularly helpful. Next slide. Next shy, we got shy. Shy, we got. Uh, we we on a time check. You got about five more minutes. We have to allow for Q and A. Absolutely, and I'm actually almost done. I don't think I'll need five, but thank you, Jessica. Um. So, um, similarly, another form of bulk purchasing support. This was offered recently to transition to telehealth as a statewide rural health not-for-profit collaboration with medical practitioners across the state of Georgia to overcome the lack of scale of small clinics and private medical practices that are unaffiliated with any large institution to have access to telehealth software. And this was accomplished through a sponsorship of the telehealth software for half a year while dealing with the initial onset and surge of the virus and it also included support to transition care and utilize the software. For medical practitioners, this took a huge load off of the medical practices to go through that process of onboarding a system. Next slide, please. There are several digital supports that have been created to assist small rural health practices with telehealth but also there are many no and low cost data streaming supports for residents, students, and rural communities, from home internet service to drive-in Wi-Fi hotspots. The latter being less ideal, of course, but can offer more immediate solution at the moment, at least. Next slide. At this point, I'd like to open this up to questions and as a friendly reminder, again, if you don't have a question, but now after this presentation of thoughts on new topics or issues covered here, you'd love to hear in more detail, please do note that in the chat. And thank you. I'll we'll open up the Q&A and I'll pass it along. All right, thank you, Shai. Thank you, Cindy. I had one question in um, related to the Paycheck Protection Program. Cindy, you had referenced that take up among child care providers was relatively low. Uh, there's a question about uh, whether that is still the case and is PPP still open? Sure, that, um, so the statistic that I cited of 6% was actually from earlier this week. So obviously there may be applications coming in as we're all here today, but that was a, an, unfortunately a fairly recent statistic. Um, that was actually down. So early indications were that it might be a little bit higher, but unfortunately that did not pan out. Um, I do believe that with the most recent extension, we will see more applications coming in. So one of the greatest, there were several challenges um, for that program for providers, not the least of which is that many providers were actually closed during the early months um, of PPP being available. And so they did not see it as a resource that was especially helpful to them. They were concerned about the timing. The other piece of that is just that as an industry, um, while many of them are businesses, they often come to this work because of a real love of children, families, community, education, more so than with necessarily a strong business background. Um, so that is one of the things that CDFIs work on is really trying to support the organizational and business pieces um, of this industry. And we know that things like applying for, for programs such as this can be really challenging for providers. They may not have all the records. They may not have the banking relationships. Um, LISC itself has 
has administered PPP loans and has done so with childcare, but certainly not with the numbers we'd like. So for folks working with providers in your communities, please, please um, make sure that they know that the program is still open, that they can still apply, and that this is something that can still benefit them. Um, we do have some resources on PPP and applying for PPP. I will put that in the chat so that you have an active link for that that you'll have available to you even before you get the, the, uh, this webinar. Uh, and I'll just add one other thing, which is that there um, may be some fear um, and some conversations that need to happen about the fear of the requirements of the PPP program. Yep, thank you both. All right, please go ahead and write in any other questions on the chat. Um, Shai, it, one question since so many folks said that their health care provision was by the regional uh, health systems and such. Are, can you direct folks to any resources either in a future webinar or now related to how some of the bigger hospital systems are responding to the COVID crisis and trying to amplify some of the uh, primary or behavioral health care that they might be offering to rural residents of their states? Absolutely. I, I will definitely do both. And one of the things that I can say is that um, the larger health systems, generally speaking, had the type of nimbleness to shift operations and also in rural areas, most especially the states to open up extensions that were outdoors for testing and screening. They have been excellent at uh, making the determinations for whom should go into the actual facility indoors versus who should be remaining outside so that they don't um, increase the caseload of COVID-19. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, and then in terms of the second half of your question, uh, the larger health systems have done two things that I think has been excellent and something that um, those in um, rural government can support. Uh, one is that they have sent folks home if they have been in the clinic or if they had concerns about a potential ER uh, stay to give them pulse oximeters and spermators to uh, continue to monitor their breathing and then a text message system where they could send in the results so that they would know when and if they have to return to the clinic. And in this way, they were able to catch people ahead of unnecessarily coming and also ensure that they get to the hospital in time to address the issues that they were having. The other thing is they have referred um, folks to services that are by phone or telehealth for mental health and behavioral health and other supplementary health needs that even include some of the uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy to support um, the uh, uh, rehabilitation of folks um, or to, again, address those who have pre-existing conditions uh, or chronic health issues to um, prevent them from becoming more susceptible than otherwise to COVID. Um, and they've done that with rural health clinics and uh, federally qualified health centers. All right. Thanks for that, Shai. Um, we got a note in the chat asking if folks can share these slides when they come out with other local officials in their region. And the answer is a resounding yes. That was wonderful. Um, for that. And then another question, it's a, a bit technical, but I'm going to flag it and we may need to bring this back to our colleagues um, and respond later. But it says, I have CDBG CB funds to address these issues discussed today. My question is, how can I do this and still meet the national objective and public benefit rule? There's a concern about 
having issues on the back end for auditing. Hi, Cindy, um, do you want to address that or hold? Yeah, no, actually, um, I'm glad that someone brought that up because um, I actually had two case studies that I did not include here, but where uh, in a couple rural counties, they received community development block grant funds and they used that for broadband uh, development. Um, and they combined it with some other funding to be sure from their state, but um, they did bring together um, basically it's about 30 miles of new fiber and four new wireless tower sites. Um, and that allowed them to connect 169 businesses, uh, 13 community anchor institutions, um, and they got direct connections to uh, five networks of county government facilities, um, a few K-12 schools, um, a medical center, and um, a few other um, infrastructure elements like the library um, uh, service authority. So, so yes, there are counties that were able to do this and by bringing together so many different entities and agencies, they were able to meet uh, and in some cases exceed uh, all of the requirements. Um, and I, I have a few other examples. I can bring them up and go over uh, in the next uh, webinar. Great, thank you. And I think your comments illustrate really well why we call digital inclusion a super determinant of health in that some of the resources or examples you're highlighting could be just as easily raised in a discussion about education access or um, the work access and such. So it's uh, clearly a very, very important issue at this time. Right, and one thing uh, I just want to add from the earlier question about the slides, I just want to reiterate in case this was missed that uh, the, the deck is meant to be a technical assistance document for you. So all of the links are live and you'll be able to click right on from the slide screen and it will open up the uh, window in your internet browser. Okay, excellent. Well, I think that's all we have coming in today. Um, I want to thank you all for your engagement and your responses to the poll questions and such, which we'll use to inform the next more detailed webinar, drilling down on some of these topics that are most important to you. Um, and also thank you very much to HUD for this opportunity here at LISC to be a resource to the field. So with that, thank you all for your time today and have a good day.